Thank you, Jackie. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to <clears throat> this forum of the Higher Education Compliance and Quality Network. Mm -hmm. These two days are not just another conference. This network is a group of people who, over a few years, have come to bond together to form relationships, professional linkages, and to learn from each other as well as learning from the major presentations. And the size of this group is very comfortable for an interactive two-day period. So everything seems to me to bode well. We've got, of course, uh, some splendid uh, presentations and led by um, Alan Robson and by the leadership of TEXA, we'll have the national scene well set right from the beginning and uh, uh, Julie Hare will make sure that we're all kept honest. But beyond that, what will happen will be some really interesting institutional and professional-based uh, leads of discussions and presentations, which will show how much our success as a sector is dependent on a big range of people working at a variety of levels, academics and professional staff within institutions, absolutely key to our long-term success. And that's what this forum is about. And that's what the Compliance and Quality Network is about. So I welcome everyone and look forward to a splendid two days. Thanks, Pong. As you know, the theme for this year is securing standards. And I wondered if you might like to think about how the new or the proposed new higher education standards framework might impact on learning and teaching in higher education institutions. Yes, thank you. I think that uh, we have been in that period from 2012-13 in a, in a somewhat uh, difficult time with bedding down a new regime concerned with regulation, accreditation, auditing standards. And I think we've come through on the other side of that. We are very lucky to have a range of sensitive, mature, competent leaders um, nationally and within the institutions. And so the discussion about standards and particularly the standards framework has now percolated right through the institutions because the people led by Alan Robson who have developed the standards framework were extremely consultative and they took the time needed to bring the community and the sector together with them. And I think that will bode well for the way that the framework is gradually brought into practice and the institutions learn how to take initiatives internally through their academic boards and uh, through their key committees and that the institutions then will be able to interact with the regulatory body with uh, and the regulatory body itself will be l linking to its own key advisory council and linking to ministers and uh, lead people in the government, uh, both uh, departmental people as well as the political people. So we're at a point where I think there's a framework that is widely endorsed and supported through the sector, better understood than was the case uh, when 
the notion was first floated by the Bradley Review back in 2008, 2009. So we're really at a liftoff point that should be very comfortable and secure for everyone. And do you think the same would apply for research and research training as well, the same thoughts? I think that the, the handling of uh, auditing research has uh, its own particular mechanisms and its own uh, leadership uh, groups and that is in a sense a bit separate from the, uh, the auditing and uh, regulation of learning and teaching and the broader engagement. Of course, research applied into industry and the professions does link in, but uh, I think we'll uh, just keep evolving in the research space and uh, again there's no need for us to be anxious that uh, things are going to uh, strike difficulties. Sure, so I guess we can just hope that the new minister um, endorses the framework. <laughs> I think we can and I think what our experience over, if you take the period from Bradley we're now looking at, what, a five, six year uh, space. Uh, we've had a number of ministers, we've had a number of spokespeople at the political level for uh, the opposition side. And over time, we've shown, I think, that there is um, an increasing understanding uh, among those people and the, and the linkages back to the um, regulatory body and to the institutions. So I'd, again, I think that uh, we can look forward with uh, a good level of confidence. Right. So in relation to our program again, um, you'll see that we have a stream on academic integrity specifically as part of the whole standards discussion. And I just wondered if you'd have any advice for universities on the rise of essay mills, plagiarism and generally cheating. Yes, the, the uh, cheating in its various forms, essay mills and plagiarism, uh, is something that has uh, developed <clears throat> more in uh, more recent uh, years I think it really has. I don't think this is just a matter of detection. I think it has been partly uh, due to the effects of globalisation and the coming into the country of uh, a large number of overseas students who come with great levels of goodwill and commitment, but they have two difficulties. One is they suddenly face a very different culture from the culture of learning and the modes of assessment that they've been used to in the past. And many come with modest uh, confidence about English language. So the temptation to cut corners and find easier ways of apparently uh, getting assignments completed and uh, uh, deposited uh, must be, uh, for some people, uh, quite high. It's not the case, of course, that the problems that we're talking about here reside only or even um, principally with um, international students. The, the new technologies provide temptations and at root, the way forward is for institutions and their staffs and the people who are in day-by-day -day contact with the students, the people who are working closely with them, it's for them to work hard at getting the very best possible understanding uh, amongst the students. 
of the fact that they don't do themselves or anyone else a service uh, through modes of cheating. The, uh, the need for hard-edged uh, policing, of course, has to be there. And indeed, a few years back, I think three or four years back, I worked here in Victoria with the uh, Victorian Ombudsman um, looking at the problem from the viewpoint of uh, three or four universities in the state uh, where there had been complaints raised uh, about uh, plagiarism, cheating and uh, uh, people handing in work that was not their own. But let's get that into a context and to say that that policing part is not the most important part. The most important part is ensuring that people understand the positive and real reasons why they need to do the work themselves. So I don't rather, think we'll solve this. So rather than just taking community action. Yes. Students, yes, so indeed. And, and Jackie, I don't think we're going to solve this, as it were, by some king hit or even um, be able to uh, get substantial shifts over time. But I think the mindset that we adopt should be that we are talking about small proportions of students. We're perhaps talking about differential proportions depending on the kind of institution, its history and its culture. And uh, I think we can go forward with the confidence that the staff and the fellow students can be at each point a step ahead of the game rather than uh, playing catch up with this problem because the, the recognition is there that in the real world that students will move to after they've completed their courses, they will be found out very quickly if they don't have the knowledge, the skills, and the confidence that comes with having those things. So I think it's important for us to be serious about the problem, to address it head on, but not to let it um, blow itself up into something much bigger than it actually is. Right. Thanks, Kwong. Good. So this time last year when we held the forum, the theme was deregulation. And I'd wondered um, if you'd like to reflect on the past year because it seems there's been a lot of uncertainty for the sector generated and it's still quite, you know, we're still in uncertain times. Just wondered if you'd like to give us your thoughts on uh, how the last 12 months have uh, been affecting universities and how they're travelling. I think the first two thirds of the last 12 months have been particularly difficult because of mixed signals. The mixed signals were not only um, to be um, ascribed to the uh, politicians or the politicians and the um, national bureaucracy. I think there have been mixed signals coming from institutions and from within parts of institutions and from uh, some of the professions. It's been a difficult period, but we're possibly coming out of it whichever way things immediately move. I think the fear of a word like deregulation and the fear about talk of $100,000 degrees, people are starting to see that in a more realistic perspective. And as I said to the forum last year, deregulation is simply that it's the institution rather than the government that determines the fees. And for international students, both undergraduate and postgraduate, it is the institutions that determine the fees. And for postgraduate domestic students, the institutions determine the fees. I understand that the undergraduate domestic component is large and important 
and uh, we are pitching to be more equitable in the scope and the range of students we're bringing in, so there's anxiety. But provided we can either come to a form of deregulation which takes the fear element out, or we come to um, rest at a more regulated um, set of arrangements, the sort of pattern that uh, opposition spokesman uh, Kim Carr has been consistently advocating, whichever way this goes, I think the uncertainty will come out in the short term. The real difficulty strikes when the, the resource levels are being really squeezed for the numbers of students that we're trying to educate. Maybe the worst period uh, since the big expansion post-Bradley has passed. And let's hope that l at least looking at the next 12 months, the next two years, that we can progress on a reasonably even keel. Mm -hmm. So do you think the, um, even though it has been a very, very uncertain times with deregulation. Do you think this has led to greater differentiation between institutions? I think we have been differentiating our institutions for some time and the growth period following Bradley, particularly those years 2010, 2011, uh, that has probably further pushed the differentiation as has the uh, more higher levels of confidence and greater security with uh, newer technologies, and MOOCs and all of those things. Uh, so I think we are more differentiated than talk about the sector or even, the, you know, talking as if we've got a, a simple group of eight and an ATN and an IRU and run... Uh, that sort of talk um, I don't think fully recognises how differentiated we are and differentiated within institutions. And it's very difficult for people who are outside the institutions to really appreciate that complexity and that differentiation and the positives that that differentiation is bringing. So... Uh, what we probably can hope for and should be hoping for is better acknowledgement and understanding of differentiation and the consequence of that, which is that while equitable funding is important at an institutional level and as between institutions, the way resources are used and the extent to which some institutions can bring additional resources in through philanthropy as well as through student uh, fee income, that we have to become a bit more sophisticated in our understanding of the need for that diversity, while at the same time, of course, being so concerned that we don't lose students who, because of their um, family income background or because of their location in um, remote and outer regional and maybe outer suburban areas, um, that their opportunities are curtailed. So it's a mix of things and uh, we try uh, to do the best we can and when you look at where Australia and its institutions stand um, internationally, we don't want to brag, but we're actually doing pretty well. Right. In terms of making that differentiation explicit, how well do you think the new Quilt, the Quality uh, Indicators for Learning and Teaching uh, website has, has brought that about, those, those facts to students? Yeah. I think that it will they that will be a help to students. The the limitation, of course, which has already been commented on, is that when you look at those uh, orange bars, the the level between 
uh, say, two or three institutions in a particular discipline field that an individual student might see as realistic options, often there's not much in it because these still the, once you take what were relatively sophisticated surveys, uh, once you put them into simple single numbers, you lose quite a lot. But that said, um, Quilt has been and is uh, a really worthwhile development. It is targeted at students. I think it will help students and particularly those who've been uh, drawn to it and shown it and shown how to use it, maybe from um, careers people in schools. Uh, it will be a useful addition, particularly for the student body. Right. I guess it's just driving the traffic to that site to make them aware that it exists. And I think so. It's so new now, but mm -hmm. uh, give it a year or so and it will, we'll learn how to use it more right. effectively. And just going back slightly again, a couple of, a couple of forums ago, you uh, made a few remarks about the approach that you were hoping that the new or the reshaped text might take in the future. So really now with the appointment of a new um, CEO and with the differentiation between the role of Chief Commissioner and CEO, I was just wondering, you had said in the past that you were hoping that, that uh, the reshaped Texa might take a light touch. Do you think that this uh, new rebirth of this new body might have some um, experience they could draw on in, in doing so? I'm hoping that that will be the case. We've got in the Chief Commissioner, Nick Saunders, uh, someone who really understands the institutions, who understands the differences between the well-established public and a uh, couple of private universities in the country and the large number of other private providers who are relatively new and in the main uh, take quite small numbers of students. And the original idea, and I hope I'm not oversimplifying this, but the original idea that we should treat everybody um, on the same basis for the same programs is understandable in principle, but the practicalities when you have one body seeking to cope with 43 universities and a total, I think, of about 170 providers, 90 of which are only uh, offering a very small uh, programs. The, the, what we now have, I think, is through uh, recently appointed new CEO with uh, good experience from uh, the UK and um, an advisory council chaired by Peter Shergold with all of his um, multiple um, background experiences that bear very relevantly, I think we've got a pretty good chance of getting this right. I, the last thing I'd say about it uh, Jackie, is that I believe still that peer review of some kind, not necessarily for whole institutions, but for programs, for uh, maybe fields like engineering and uh, those that have professional accreditation as well, that that is going to continue to be a key element and I'm really glad that Denise Chalmers and others are going to be raising that in these next two days because while we have now new uh, broad regulatory um, mechanisms and enshrined in quite uh, clear legislation, um, the importance of quality assurance and improvement over time and benchmarking, which will be quite big in these two days, I think, the discussions, uh, all of those things are, continue to be really important and I don't think they will get lost, but it's important that they don't 
in a context of big scale institutional review. Sure, and of course Dr Sarah Booth from the University of Tasmania has been doing a lot of work in this regard and um, we'll talk over during the forum about establishing a College of Peer Review. Yes, I was delighted to see that. I think Sarah's giving two papers yes, and uh, that should be um, really valuable. And I think, if I might say so, that, you know, the, the word of the moment is being agile and entrepreneurial and innovative. And Sarah and a number of the other presenters at this uh, forum will be fostering exactly those things. Thanks so much, Paul. I really appreciate our chat today and I know that um, you'll stimulate a lot of thought-provoking discussion at the forum. Just sorry that you can't be there with Thank us you. on the day, but we'll be thinking of you. Thank you. And uh, we've been listening to Emeritus Professor Kwong Lee Dow and today's presentation would not have been possible without the generous support of the University of Melbourne. Thank you. Thank you.